Welcome to another edition of the Bully Pulpit Show. I'm your host, Mark Joseph, and today we have another incredible guest, Ben Stein, who is a author, economist, actor, writer. Have I missed anything? Speech writer, dad, lawyer. 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 Thanks for joining us, Ben. Teacher. Teacher. Now, you must get absolutely tired of the Bueller questions, but I have to ask it anyway. How did that come about? Had you already been acting for a number of years when that happened? No, I never had acted at all, except I played a pilgrim in my sixth grade Thanksgiving play. And uh, I was, had been a, a, given a small part in a universal picture called The Wildlife, uh, where I played the owner of an army surplus store. And then uh, Michael Chinich and John Hughes asked me to be in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. All I was going to do was read the role off camera. Adams, Adamly, Adamowski, Bueller, Bueller. And I started doing that off camera, and the uh, students laughed so hard, the student extras, that uh, John Hughes said, we're going to have you do that on camera, and we're going to have you teach a scene on camera. Uh, we're going to have you ad-lib a scene. What's a subject you could teach from memory? So that, I did that and got amazing applause from the students and the uh, camera people and sound people on the stage. And I thought, great, they've learned a lot about economics. They're grateful. But no, they were laughing because it was so boring. So uh, anyway, uh, I thought it was interesting. still think it was interesting. But after that, I worked steadily. And this is a topic that interests you. Your father, Herbert Stein, right. worked for President Nixon. What did he well, do? he did many, many other things besides that. He was a very famous economist. Uh, he was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for the president, uh, for uh, Mr. Nixon, and then briefly for Mr. Ford. So you grew up talking about this stuff in the household. You oh, were yeah. Talking economics. Oh, yeah. And what about, uh, what was that like? You grew up in Washington? I grew up in a suburb of Washington called Silver Spring, Maryland. I uh, mostly grew up in that suburb because the nice neighborhoods in Washington itself did not allow Jews. So I grew up in a different world where there was a lot of restrictions against Jews, blacks, Asians, women, Hispanics, because they were, we were inferior races, so we were discriminated against. You're, you're, not, you're not joking, this, you're serious. No, no, this is in your was. lifetime. Oh yeah, this absolutely. Is how, and how did that affect the way you uh, perceived the world? I mean, what does that do? I didn't do? like it. I didn't like it. It's not nice to be discriminated against or considered to be from an inferior race. And uh, I, uh, I grew up really hating discrimination and prejudice and racism. And uh, I uh, was very happy when the laws changed and uh, people uh, were prohibited from behaving in a racist way. They could still have racist thoughts. It's a free society, but I don't want them behaving in racist ways. Uh, and I think all of that is closely tied in with Darwinism because Darwinism legitimized the idea that there are superior and inferior races. See, I have a theory about Darwinism, which is a little different from most people's theory about Darwinism. I don't think it was science. I think it was ideology and sociology uh, legitimized by fake pseudoscience. That is, I think it was basically a way of legitimizing the dominion over the earth by white male northern Europeans. It was not really a way of explaining anything because it doesn't really explain anything. It was really a way of, exp of uh, allowing the dominant uh, a group, social group in the world to explain their dominance as if it had some scientific basis instead of just having been various accidents or, or luck or just the result of superior toughness and meanness. Now this movie you're a part of, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, have you always been interested in this topic, or is this more of a recent phenomenon for you? Uh, no, it's a, the, I've always been interested in Darwinism and, and what Darwinism really is, and Darwinism really is a way of legitimizing racism. Um, but I've, uh, at least to me, I mean, that's my theory about it. But, the, uh, but uh, I think uh, intelligent design, well, I never really thought of it as being called intelligent design. I always was a believer. I always believed that God created everything. Um, I don't know that God did it in six days and read and rested on the seventh day. It might have been six million years. I don't, just don't know, or six billion years. I don't know. But what I do know is that uh, one day there was mud and slime and ooze, and the next day there was life. And the Darwinists have never explained how that happened. I know that one day there was, uh, there was nothing and there was chaos, and then there were, was... What is that? It's a helicopter I looking assume. for you. I assume so. And then there was, uh, 
and then there was gravity and the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of physics and the laws of motion and a whole set of organizing principles that organized the universe. And where the heck did that come from? Did that come from accident and uh, random mutation and natural selection? Where did that come from? Nobody's ever been able to explain it. Uh, and I think the explanation that God did it is as good an explanation as any explanation that Darwinists have come up with. But of course, the Darwinists control the deal. They control, they're like the dealers at uh, Caesar's Palace or Harris. They control the bank. So uh, we're just poor, lowly slobs asking for a place at the table to express our views. I mean, I think it's fair to say you're a pretty prominent in the conservative movement, but not all conservatives. Not, I'm not that prominent in it anymore. I mean, there's so many parts of the conservative movement that I disagree with that I don't know that I would consider myself prominent anymore because, I'm, for, exa for example, I'm in favor of a balanced budget and they're not. But not all conservatives agree with you on this stuff. What kind of feedback have you gotten f since you've been talking about this issue from conservatives? I'm going to make this a good short answer. It's all been extremely positive. I have not had one bit of negative feedback at all from conservative groups. I mean, if there has been some, maybe just my luck and fate has been, I haven't seen it, but I haven't seen one bit of negative feedback from conservatives. Plenty of negative feedback, but none from conservatives. Talk about the movie. How did you get involved? I got in the movie, uh, involved in the movie because the producers, uh, Walt Ruloff, uh, Logan Kraft and uh, John Sullivan approached me, told me about it. I was captivated by it immediately, especially by the parts having to do with uh, the connection of Darwinism to the Holocaust. And I was uh, especially captivated by uh, the fact that science was able to explain so little of the origins of life. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to work on it. I little dreamed it would be anywhere near as elaborate a project as it became. I mean, I thought it was going to be just a very tiny little thing that would be shown in church basements. I had no idea it would be as big as it was. It's a very elegantly, beautifully, highly produced uh, work of art that I think will live for a long time in the annals of uh, documentary movies. And, and I, even if I were not in it at all, it would still be a fabulous movie. My part in it is really very small. There are a couple of issues. First of all, the linking of Darwinism to Nazism. Yes. I mean, for some, this is like yelling fire in a crowded theater. Uh, are you going to well, get... What are you it, it, well, it's all right to yell fire in a crowded theater if there is fire in a crowded theater. What, who, who do you imagine might be the most upset by that? or object to the, I mean, the any notion. Indiv people who, uh, whose livelihood depends on Darwinism being uh, a legitimate uh, sacrosanct theory, people who make their mortgage payments depending on Darwinism being a legitimate sacrosanct theory, they'll be upset about it. But there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you read, uh, if you read books by German philosophers and German theorists of racism, they clearly rely on Darwin. Uh, they clearly are uh, in love with Darwin. Uh, Hitler's ideas and those of his followers were clearly influenced by Darwinism. And uh, it, Darwinism was hugely popular in Germany from the get-go. I think probably more popular in Germany than in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, they, they got into it. It was a way of legitimizing a, a feeling they had always had, which was that they were racially superior. And uh, he, he in, essence, in essence, said, that isn't just a superstition. That isn't just your view of it. It's truth. It's revealed truth. It's just, you know what it's like? It's like people who become fantastically rich through some kind of market chicanery and then say, oh, uh, this is the way it's divine. God wants me to be rich. That, that's sort of like that. But how is it that many Americans think that, Dar that uh, Hitler was a Christian or influenced by Christian beliefs when you're saying it wasn't Christian beliefs at all, it was Darwin? I didn't know anyone thought that about People think he's a, a Christian. They, they do? Sure. Some do. I don't think. I, I, I mean, he, he said in some of his early speeches, I am a Catholic. I will always be a Catholic. But he later said in his uh, mem in, in uh, conversations that have been recorded by memoirists of the time, I said all that because I'm a politician and I wanted the Catholic vote. Of course, he said, I think Jesus was a fool and led men down the path of allowing the weak to survive, which is the exact opposite of the way that the life should go. He was, oh my God, uh, the idea of calling Hitler a Christian is just revolting. That's just nauseating. Okay, we'll come Hitler back. was the exact opposite of what a Christian is supposed to be. We'll exact back. opposite. We'll be back in just a moment with Ben Stein and continue the conversation. Stay tuned.
And we're back with our guest, Ben Stein. And Ben, we're talking about your latest film, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. You have what, what I call sort of reverse conversion stories of people who were able to move away from faith in God sort of through Darwinism. Can you talk about that? Well, we interviewed a number of scientists who said that uh, Darwinism and the explanations that Darwinism gave for, gave for how life uh, evolved had uh, shown them that there was no need for religion, that religion was irrelevant, and that they had then stopped believing in God, and they felt better about it. They felt their lives had been greatly uh, improved by not believing in God. To me, that's just nonsense. I mean, uh, you can believe in God and also believe in what little Darwinism has to offer uh, to science, namely the evolution within species. Uh, I don't see any, na any natural or inevitable a conflict, but a lot of people, I think, feel better not believing in God because uh, they do not want to be held morally culpable for their uh, sins or misconduct, and they don't want to feel as if there's any kind of uh, judgment waiting for them. And I think also they don't want to feel as if there's any kind of moral code dictating how they should act. They just get what they want, try to get everything they can get, whatever they can't get, they'll try to get the next day. What surprised you the most going into the project as you would travel and interview folks? What did you not expect? The single most startling moment in making the movie was uh, when we went to a Nazi death factory called Hadamar, where uh, mentally unstable people, alcoholics, uh, people who couldn't hold a job, uh, were killed because they were not sufficiently uh, Aryanized and superior. and. Uh, I asked the curator of this, a woman in her, I would guess in her 30s, uh, what would you say to the people who ran this place? What would you say to them if you could talk to them now? She said, it wouldn't be my place to say anything to them. And I said something like, I'm paraphrasing her, I said something like, well, surely they were madmen. And she said, no, they were scientists just doing Darwinist work. Hmm. And I noticed you, in the film, you walk outside and you sort of sat down and it was almost as if the weight of what you had heard was just sinking in. What was that like? That was at Dachau. Well, I, it wasn't so much what I had heard as what I had seen. I'd seen these uh, little narrow pathways where the uh, prisoners walked, and if you just strayed off the pathway and stepped onto the gas, uh, grass, you'd be shot. It was a death sentence to step on the grass. And why not kill these people? Because these people were just declared to be just human tuberculosis and vermin lower than vermin, just human tuberculosis. And so why not kill them? Hmm. And, and as you, how long did you spend in Europe on this uh, shoot? Maybe a month altogether. Hmm. I don't know, roughly that. And now you're part of this campaign now where you're uh, publicity marketing, doing the film. Uh, you said you expected it to be a much smaller scale project. Well, when we first started talking about it, I didn't know that they even planned a theatrical release. I thought, for all I know, it's going to be shot and shown in church basements. I didn't. I had no idea. The people who are making this movie are the most capable, hardworking, imaginative people you've ever seen in your life. I mean, these these people are going to take over all of Hollywood before they're done. I mean, they're just amazing. Hmm. Now, jumping back a little bit in your career, of all the things you've done—the speech writing, the writing the books, the columns—which do you find the most interesting, the most enjoyable as you're doing it? Well, the easiest is doing voiceover work like for cartoons. That's the most fun. Um, the most rewarding intellectually and psychologically is uh, speaking to audi live audiences. And the most fun in terms of being part of a team, which is a big part of life, has been working on this movie because I feel like I'm part of a very hardworking, successful, altruistic team that, that really does try to put the uh, goal of the success of the entity ahead of any one person's ego. Yeah. But I guess if I had to summarize all of it, the most wonderful thing I ever do is visit the families and the patients themselves at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in, or the Bethesda Naval, Naval Medical Hospital in uh, Washington and Bethesda and see these brave men and women who've been wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan and see their courage and their heroism and uh, they are deeply, deeply, deeply impressive people. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. And you know what? Uh, people say to me all the time, oh, you're so brave to have made this movie. Oh, that's not brave. Nobody's going to shoot me over making this movie. Nobody's going to blow my legs off making this movie. The real stars are not the people in Hollywood. The real stars are not people like you and me sitting in front of a camera in an easy chair. The real stars 
are putting on battle dress uniform over body armor and going out in 130 degree heat in Iraq and Ramadi and Fallujah and al Nasiriyah and getting their brains blown out for you and me. Those are the real stars. And to be able to pay tribute to them and to hold their hand and to tell them that the people of America thank them, that is the greatest privilege I have in my whole life. But what kind of blowback or feedback will you get for being a part of this film? What are you, what are you hearing? Uh, well, I get a lot of negative e emails. I get a lot of hate emails. And uh, What do they say? I can't say on the air what they say. <laughs> I really can't. I mean, extremely nasty stuff. But, um, you know, I've been involved in unpopular causes a large part of my life. I've been involved in the Right to Life movement uh, pretty intensely for about 30 years. I was a speechwriter for Richard Nixon, and I'm still a defender of Richard Nixon. I'm used to, uh, I'm used to being criticized and uh, getting hate mail. So, you know, I, the amount of hate mail I get every day, I think would uh, upset people who aren't used to it. But since I'm used to it, it doesn't upset me that much. You've written 30 plus books. The one that Roughly sticks out 30. in my mind is The View from Sunset Boulevard. Right, about the political messages of Hollywood. Was it 19, early 70s you wrote that? Late 70s. Late 70s. Now that presaged a lot of the work that came later from many others. Uh, what, what, was, uh, what, what got you, what inspired you to write that book at that time? I had never been a thorough, <clears throat> sorry, a thorough television watcher ever in my life. I've never watched much TV until I moved to Santa Cruz, California and taught at UC Santa Cruz. And there, there was not much to do a lot of the time. And I watched a lot of television. And I was astonished at how consistent the plot lines of movies and TV, sh of TV shows in particular were. And I was astonished at the consistent message, anti-business, anti-military, anti-religion, anti-small town, anti-Christian, and uh, pro-abortion. And I was just astonished at how that came rolling out time after time. And I thought, hmm, wonder why it's coming out that way all the time. And then I spent a lot of time in Hollywood, uh, courtesy of the Wall Street Journal, for whom I was writing a column. And I noticed that the people who worked in Hollywood hated business, hated small towns, hated the military, uh, hated Republicans, hated, uh, were, were all pro-abortion. And I thought, well, we're not getting a random sample of America's feelings on these subjects. We're just getting the views of a small clique in Hollywood that controls the media. And I wrote a book about that. Hmm. And what is the organizing principle of the clique? That, they're, that they haven't been to the 48 other states? Uh, no, uh, they're actually 49 other states. But the, uh, the other, the, uh, are you thinking of New York and California? <laughs> the two states. Um, the, uh, <laughs> that's funny. The, uh, the, uh, I think the organizing principle is uh, we are leftists, we are the vanguard of the working proletariat, we are the uh, intellectual lights of the Communist Party, and we know better than all these small town hicks. And these small town hicks are gonna kill us or we're gonna kill them. It's a struggle. We're gonna, one of us is gonna win and it's gonna be us. But you also write columns for the New York Times. You appear in mainstream I media. Write, I've been writing for the Times for a long time. How do you get away with talking like this and that you're also, I mean, you're part of the establishment too, so they obviously welcome you in some way. Oh, they welcome the me. Uh, the, the New York Times column is about finance and uh, it has nothing to do with Darwinism or anything like that. I've never even mentioned Darwinism and don't ever intend to in that column. Um, I write about finance and actually write about the often financial misconduct by people on Wall Street because I may assure you I'm not a big fan of Wall Street. Uh, I mean, I think Wall Street is, uh, it's got its place and it does some useful work, but it's also got an awful lot of bad people. Um, and uh, as to the other, I don't know that I, uh, the CBS News, I have to say, I have to say CBS News has been unbelievably fair and good to me. I don't have one single complaint about CBS News. They're just unbelievably nice to me and uh, they've never told me that I can't talk about anything. Uh, I mean, sometimes they'll say, you know, you've just been on too much lately. We've got to give some other commentators a chance to be on. But uh, they never, ever have told me what I can and cannot say. Well, there was one other uh, very well-known news network, not CNN, uh, not Fox, that did tell me I was politically incorrect and they couldn't have me on anymore. 
Well, they implicitly told me that. They just stopped, after I said something, they stopped having me on. Mm. Um, but uh, other than that, I get a pretty fair shake, I think, from the establishment. Hollywood's a different story. In Hollywood, uh, yes, I got my game show, and I, we won seven Emmys, and I made some money from it. But when I was a screenwriter, uh, they treated me like dirt because I was a conservative, just a, like dirt. Hmm. We'll come back in just a moment with our guest, Ben <clears throat> Stein. Stay tuned. And we're back with Ben Stein, uh, whose new movie is called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Um, tell me what's happening with the film. Uh, how many theaters is it coming out and where is it going to be playing across the country? It's going to be playing everywhere across the country. We're, uh, I, we're speaking about uh, two or three weeks before the opening, which is April 18th. And uh, we already have 600 theaters booked. We're expecting to get 1,000. Um, It'll be everywhere. You can just put it, go to the website www.expelledthemovie.com. It'll show you how to find where it's playing near you. Um, I tell you, the main thing is this is a very unusual movie because you leave this movie feeling as if your life is not meaningless. You're not just a matter, a piece of matter and junk to be exploited. You have some connection with the divine. You you are not just mud animated by being struck by lightning. There is something divine about you uh, and some connection with the creator and uh, therefore you better act right or as right as you can. I mean, we're all extremely fallible. Uh, and uh, you had better treat your fellow human beings with some dignity. And if you do, you're going to be part of the divine forever. And, uh, that, and you're not just a piece of mud. I mean, Darwinists just say you're a piece of mud. If I wanted to say what this movie about is about, I'd say, you're not a piece of mud. Well, I was kind of surprised some of the folks in the movie were giving interesting, or you actually asked, what do you think happened? And some of the answers were really unusual. One guy said that life began on the backs of crystals. I have no idea what that means. Uh, another guy, a very, very, very famous guy, said that uh, maybe life on Earth had been seeded by people from outer space. Well, where'd they come from? Well, we're not sure of that. Anyway, um, the Darwinists, by and large, didn't impress me at all. You know, when I'm in the presence of someone really smart, I know it. Uh, my father was unbelievably smart. I was just awed by being around him. Mr. Nixon was incredibly smart. I was awed by being around him. Probably the smartest person living in the United States right now is Warren Buffett. I'm just awed when I'm around him. I, I'm just, my head is spinning. He's so smart. But... Uh, the Darwinists didn't impress me at all. They impressed me with their cockiness and their condescension. But I've done a lot of cocky, condescending people. Do you think you'll do other movies like this with dip on different topics in the future? Is it, did, did the bug bite you? I'd like to. I mean, uh, it's up to the producers. I'm certainly not capable of doing it myself. But if the producers want to do another one, I'd be delighted to do it. It's been a very good experience. What other topics would interest you along that line? Sanctity of life is the main one. I think uh, I'd like to do one on the sanctity of life. I'd like to do one on the military family, who is the backbone of America, uh, who are the backbones of America. I would like to do one on uh, the shenanigans and tricks Wall Street plays with our money. That's all I've thought of so far. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you us, so man. much, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. And I should also add that the parent company of this program was involved with the film. Uh, but thank you for joining us for another edition of The Bully Pulpit Show. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>